Well, hey guys, it's good to be with you again for Adult Sunday School, and here we are, our second week in our new quarter. We are moving on uh, with the book of Daniel. Um, last week, if you remember, we were in the book of Jeremiah, and so now we are kind of transitioning a little deeper into the exile. Last week in Jeremiah 30, we were looking at the prospect of what was getting ready to come as goes the beginning of exile with respect to the launching of a siege, the Babylonians being responsible for this. And as we've discussed a little bit of the historicity behind that, and I'm sure many of you are probably familiar with this, having heard it many times from teachers and preachers alike, that there are at least two, maybe three, that I think there's very good evidence to support probably three um, separate sieges and waves of deportation. Of course, that third one being the final great last uh, siege and ultimate deportation of all those who were left behind with the exception of poorest of the poor in Jeremiah to stay there in Jerusalem. And that community didn't last very long. Um, as you round out the end of Jeremiah's scroll. <clears throat> but having said all that, now what we're doing is transitioning our frame of reference over to Babylon, where we are going to be looking at some of the material from Daniel and what's transpiring during the exile. And of course, a good contemporary source to also look at would be Ezekiel. And we're not going to hash out just when exactly Daniel arrived Ezekiel arrived and how much time did they spend as contemporaries of each other and their ministries were quite different and the layout of their scrolls uh, I think bear that out especially considering the the neatness of Daniel as goes the first six chapters being dedicated very cleanly um, to Daniel's time uh, they are in <clears throat> Babylon and then eventually in the capital or one of the capitals of the Persian Empire and that being Susa um, and whatnot, and what transpired under the reigns of different kings and different empires for the entirety of his service in both. <clears throat> and of course, there's lots of parallel structuring going on there. And, you know, we don't have time to go into all that. But then chapters seven through 12, uh, a different side to Daniel's ministry, as goes all of the prophetic visions um, that really is more or less a, an unpacking or a breaking down even more and from different angles. The original vision that was given early on in Daniel's ministry with Nebuchadnezzar in chapter two of Daniel. Uh, but Daniel is not really considered a prophet to the people in the way that so many of the other prophets, even Ezekiel is, because Ezekiel is living amongst the people. And of course, many of his skits and prophetic uh, dioramas and dramas and whatnot are related directly to the people as, again, he lives among them. Daniel is pulled out of the mass of exiles that is brought over there because he's young, he appears fair or handsome. He's a <clears throat> member of either the, the royal family or one of the high noble households from Judah. And because of that, he is selected for duty in the palace, which we'll see in this text we're about to read here. And so Daniel does not spend his life down with the exiles. That doesn't mean there isn't some interchange between Daniel and his own countrymen. It's not quite like the figure of Moses who is isolated in Pharaoh's palace and may get a chance to go visit with some of his brothers and sisters <clears throat> who are in exile, in slavery. We know he does eventually at some point venture out to see a taskmaster beating one of his Hebrew brothers. And then, of course, that causes him in anger to rise up and slay that Egyptian and whatnot. But we have no record of Daniel actually doing any of that. But that does not mean he did not. But Daniel's visions, of course, at some point become treasured and prized by the exilic community as they move back to Israel and, of course, cart with them uh, the writings that Daniel gave. So they had to know who he was and they had to appreciate the fact that he was one of their own up there in the palace. And, of course, that those visions at some point were transmitted to them as well so that they could read them, they could understand them and then uh appreciate how they impacted their future as goes how it looked for several centuries into their future as goes the timing of when messiah would arise and the ending of the this age of empires and whatnot so all that to say there's a, a lot going on here and a lot of biblical material that gives us a, a good understanding of what life was like in the period of the exile not to mention all the extra biblical 
resources um, and even the intertestamental resources, which we would call extra biblical, because many of us as Protestants, we do not hold to divine inspiration of the apocryphal books. But for some time, um, you know, several centuries, they have held a prized place in Christian tradition and still do for many variations of Catholic orthodoxy. And they look to those, at least for the historicity of those books, and they also give us some very good clues as to what life in exile was like. So anyway, let's read here from Daniel chapter 1. We just got this one large passage, and then we'll break it down. So beginning in verse 8 to 21, Daniel determined that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine he drank. So he asked permission from the chief eunuch not to defile himself. Now God had granted Daniel kindness and compassion from the chief eunuch. Yet he said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who assigned your food and drink. What if he sees your faces looking thinner than the other young men your age? You would endanger my life with the king. So Daniel said to the guard whom the chief eunuch had assigned to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then examine our appearance and the appearance of the young men who are eating the king's food and deal with your servants based on what you see. He agreed with them about this and tested them for 10 days. And at the end of the 10 days, they looked better and healthier than all the young men who were eating the king's food. So the guard continued to remove their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. God gave these four young men knowledge and understanding in every kind of literature and wisdom. Daniel also understood visions and dreams of every kind. At the end of the time that the king had said to present them, the chief eunuch presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king interviewed them, and among all of them, no one was found equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they began to attend the king in every matter of wisdom and understanding that the king consulted them about. And he found them ten times better than all the magicians and mediums in his entire kingdom. Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. All right, if you'll join me now for a time of prayer. Jesus, our king, we are always grateful Lord, for the fact that you shepherd us, you provide for us. Lord, you <clears throat> mercifully endure us at times when we are stubborn and uh, when we are rather dead set on doing things our way and not listening to you. And of course, that happens repeatedly throughout the week and even in times when we don't realize that's what's going on. But yet in your grace and mercy, you continue to forbear us and you bear us up in your never failing Lord. And we are so grateful for that. Thank you, Lord, for being merciful and opening our eyes to help us understand and see you and understand your heart better. As we have read through scripture this week, we've listened to it being preached upon, talked about in podcasts and various other things, the things that we've read. And we just pray that as we now come together for a climactic moment of worship in Sunday school and, of course, in, together in service at church, or maybe we there are those out there listening who will not quite have that opportunity, Father. For those who are underneath the sound of my voice, if this is the only chance that they get to hear something from someone this week, then I'm grateful and humble by the opportunity. And I pray for your glory's sake, Lord, that you use me in every sense that you intend to, Lord. And I pray, Lord, <laughs> invoking your compassion upon me, that you would use me in spite of my faults and failures, because I have <laughs> no natural talents or gifting of my own. Everything I have is what you have gifted me with, Lord. And I choose to use it, Lord, to bring honor and glory to you because there is no other worthy cause. And so I pray that as we look deeply into these words, may we garner something that perhaps is new and challenging and fresh. And may we see this in light of everything else that we've already understood and, and studied in Scripture. And, of course, things that we have yet to discover <clears throat> or discuss, but may we discover in ways or new ways it connects to those things. We ask all this in your holy and blessed name. Amen. So just give me a quick second. I've got a space here over here beside me. I'm going to turn that puppy down because it's just a little bit too hot. Okay. All right. So um, choosing to talk about this concept of the wisdom of God subverting the will of a king. There's a lot of history here. I would really love to just spend some time breaking down, but I'm going to have to do my best to try to summarize it as quickly and as concisely as possible, because otherwise the whole hour and a half that we'll spend together or however much this ends up being 
um, would pretty much be dedicated to that. And it is a worthwhile study, but again, it's not the point of what we're looking at here. But I want to isolate just a couple things going on here in Daniel 1 and 2 and how it parallels with Jeremiah 36, because we remember in the historicity of what's going on here that the exile itself is not just one consolidated thing in that it, it, there's not just a finite moment in which there is the kingdom of Judah and everybody who's there under their king in Jerusalem, and then an invading horde comes in. They lay siege to them, they conquer them, they kill a bunch of people, and then they cart everybody else off into exile. Again, there is at least two, very likely three moments in which Nebuchadnezzar does that. And 586 is the third and final time in which the curtains close on Jerusalem as the capital of the Judite kingdom. And there is no son of David to rule over them from then on. And even to this very day, there is yet to be a Davidic king who has sat on a throne in a palace in Jerusalem over a newly established kingdom or a newly reminted kingdom, I guess you could say. But all that to say that from the first and second <clears throat> sieges in, in Nebuchadnezzar's deportation of people away that sees the likes of Daniel and Ezekiel bled out of Jerusalem and eventually taken over into Babylon to begin their period of exile there. There are still people who are in Jerusalem and, of course, the kingdom that resides in Judah. So roughly the time that Daniel sees himself being deported over there, there is a king descended from Josiah and, of course, David named Jehoiakim, who is currently ruling, and he rules for roughly 11 years. And, of course, uh, one of his brothers will be the one who rules after him. A son will come from Jehoiakim that will reign on the throne for roughly three months. He's deposed, carted off into exile, that being Jehoiachin, while Jehoiakim dies. <clears throat> and then Zedekiah is propped up on the throne, and he will reign for 11 years. So from Josiah unto Zedekiah, you have a king that rules for three months, deposed, king that rules for 11 years, another king that rules for three months, deposed, and then a king who rules for 11 years, and then he is carted off into exile. So during Jehoiakim's reign, and he is the one who is positioned on the throne first by Necho, king of Egypt, but it would be during that time that Necho is basically bottled up in Egypt and doesn't come out of Egypt any longer because he is powerless to really challenge Nebuchadnezzar. And of course, the Babylonians are going to ultimately wind up conquering them. But having said that, what we understand is that Jehoiakim is a puppet king from the time of his inauguration or coronation as king, either to Egypt and then eventually to Babylon. And he will rebel against Babylon, and that's what brings Nebuchadnezzar's wrath against him. <clears throat> and then the, the reestablishment of another king after him. So during this time period that Daniel is carted off into exile, which is not the third and final time in 586, it's in one of the previous deportation waves, which is several years actually before 586, because 605 is the time in which Nebuchadnezzar is coronated as king over Babylon in the place of his now newly deceased father, Nebuchadnezzar. And between 605 and 586 are these two other times of deportation. And of course, Daniel is caught up in one of those earlier movements. So with that, that means life is continuing on in Jerusalem and not flourishing diminishing until it leads up until eventually that third and final time Nebuchadnezzar comes. So in Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, listen to this. The third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim of Judah. Remember, he rules for a total of 11 years. So during that time period, we have Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, who is now in Babylon, the city, right? Not just the empire or the kingdom itself, the proper province that was once ruled over by Assyria and what has always been the ancient kingdom, but he's actually in the capital city. And that's important to recognize because Nebuchadnezzar is constantly going west back into the area of the Levant, what we would call the modern day states of Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, and Israel. And he's messing around over there to exert his dominance to make sure those kingdoms over there recognize that as he has taken over for Assyria and defeated them, that if they want to rise up and rebel against them, then he'll come over there and trounce them and uh, just take all the wind out of their sails as he utterly demoralizes them through conquest and whatnot. And then do what the Assyrians did in deporting them away and making sure that he just 
basically strips away any chance or sense of hope in their minds of ever reconstituting their kingdom once again if he chooses to no longer allow them to maintain some measure of sovereignty while of course underneath his um, dominion as their emperor so in the third year of Jehoiakim King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon comes to Jerusalem he laid siege to it and the Lord handed Jehoiakim of Judah over to him that doesn't mean that Jehoiakim is then deposed as king remember this is his third year. He will rule for another eight years. So that's just to simply say that Nebuchadnezzar easily defeated him in battle and was able to do with him what he wanted to. But he left him as king. And then he carried off some of the vessels from the house of God. And of course, he takes them to Babylon to the house of his God and put the vessels in the treasury of his God. That makes it sound like this is the end for Judah, but it's not. So it's important for us to situate this. Because when Nebuchadnezzar comes back in 586 and he utterly destroys Jerusalem, everything that's left behind, as goes, what vessels were not then at that point taken away by Nebuchadnezzar in the third and final deportation and the conquest of Jerusalem, then they will be and they will be set up in another temple. So this is not that moment, right, when Jerusalem is destroyed. Now, take this over to Jeremiah 36. And the reason why I bridge this over there is because in the fourth year, so this is the next regnal year uh, of the reign of Jehoiakim, and sometime after that moment when Nebuchadnezzar had come and laid siege and then, of course, defeated him and took away a vast amount of wealth and several people in a deportation. Then we have the word coming to Jeremiah, who is also a contemporary of Daniel and Ezekiel, but he is a prophet on the ground in Jerusalem. And he is told to take a scroll, write on it all the words that God has spoken concerning Israel, Judah, and all the nations from the time that he had first spoken in Josiah's reign. So that's been several years worth of collected sermons and addresses that Josiah, I'm, I'm sorry, Jeremiah has given to the people. He's told to record it all, and then he's to read it out loud. And the idea is that perhaps some of the house of Judah will hear about it and the disaster that God is planning to bring on them, <clears throat> each one of them. Um, and maybe they will turn from their evil way, and then I will forgive their iniquity and their sin in that Second Chronicles chapter 7 kind of way, right? But what winds up happening here is something rather dastardly on the part of Jehoiakim, because Jeremiah doesn't go and read these things out loud. He's something of a wanted criminal at this point, so his scribe, his secretary, Baruch, does that very thing. But before I get to that point, let me go to Daniel chapter 2, and we're not really going to have the chance to discuss Daniel 2 and that vision. We'll get into that a little bit next week when we go over our final lesson in Daniel. And that's coming from Daniel 5. But notice this, though. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams that troubled him. So this, again, is roughly around 604, 603. Um, there's a lot of discussion as to go as goes, how do you start the calculation of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar after he is actually coronated after the death of his father. We're not going to get into all of that. <clears throat> but all that to simply say, this is well over a decade before he comes and finally destroys Jerusalem. But he has these dreams in his palace. We know the dream is the colossal image. But then, you know, he's troubled because of the fact that not only did this disturb his sleep, he doesn't know what it means, but all, all the wise men and magicians and whatnot are called before him. And he wants not only the interpretation, but the dream so he can then rely that their interpret on them to know that their interpretation is indeed true. So Arioch quickly brings Daniel before the king and says to him, I found a man among the Judean exiles who can let the king know the interpretation. Just to cut to the quick of it, though, when King Nebuchadnezzar hears it, he falls face down. He worships Daniel. Such a scandalous thing on multiple fronts. The idea that the king is now prostrating himself to someone he recognizes as higher than him, at least in the court of the gods. I do not advocate gods in the plural sense. Obviously, this is Nebuchadnezzar's way of thinking. But nonetheless, he, he worships Daniel. There's a whole conversation to be had about that. We're not going to get into that. But he gives orders to present an offering and incense to him. And the king said to Daniel, your God is indeed God of gods, Lord of lords, and a revealer of mysteries, since you are able to reveal this mystery. In other words, he reverences God, and he reverences the word that God gives and he does this by paying some measure of obeisance to Daniel as God's image bearer before him, which is a common thing that Nebuchadnezzar would do in Babylonian religion, especially their chief deity, Marduk, 
is considered to be a deity who is not one who lives exalted in the heavens. Now, he is king of the gods, the head of the pantheon, but he has a very intimate place amongst his people, and there's a whole conversation to be had about that too. But uh, one interesting thing about that conversation is that in the coronation ceremony of Babylonian monarchs, there's some speculation that either the king uh, was supposed to receive the crown directly from the hands of Marduk, which, of course, the god would not be there to do that. It's a statue made of gold of Marduk and the crown laying in the hands of the statue and that the king is supposed to take the crown from his hands. Albeit some speculate that the idea is just an expression that the king is being conferred the right to reign from the chief deity Marduk. But their concept of Marduk was that he lived in the palace they made for him, his temple in the sanctum where his statue was kept, unless they brought it out for special occasions, that he occupied that space. And so this was a deity who was near to them in that sense. And the reason why I bring that up is because it's a common thing for them to go and to bow down and pay wor uh, homage and give their obeisance to this statue. And so for Nebuchadnezzar to do this, it's in a sense like he's worshiping Daniel as God or certainly a representative of God. And so with that, he is responding to God's word in a proper way uh, with respect to giving that God, the God of Daniel, glory. While on the other hand, around the time that Nebuchadnezzar is receiving this dream and the interpretation from Daniel, you have Jehoiakim, a son of David, a man who should be in every respect open to revelation that God gives to the mouth of his prophet, which at this point is Jeremiah. And responding to this properly in faith, this is the story we get back in Jeremiah 36. The king sent Jehudi to get the scroll that Jeremiah was commissioned to write. He took it from the chamber of Elishama, the scribe. Jehudi then read it in, in the hearing of the king and all the officials who were standing by the king. And since it was the ninth month, the king was sitting in his winter quarters with a fire burning in front of him. And as soon as Jehudi would read three or four columns, Jehoiakim would cut the scroll with the scribe's knife and throw the columns into the fire in the hearth until the entire scroll was consumed by the fire in the hearth. This was the way he treated the revelation that came from God, years worth of it from his predecessors, his father up until now. And as they heard all these words, the king and his servants did not become terrified or tear their clothes. It's clear that their hearts are completely hardened. I mean, they are as dead wood at this point uh, or stone in, in comparison to Nebuchadnezzar, who's Heart at this point is not moved to abandon all sense of paganistic religion, but of course to respond to the God who he recognizes as chief among the gods. He is the God who reigns in heaven and makes known his will as he reveals his mysteries to his servants and others as well, right? Through the mouths of those servants. It's just a, a very ironic contrast, and this is one of many examples of this kind of thing that you have in scripture, but it's just jumping off the pages but, of course, we have to put these things together, and these accounts aren't so accessible in that sense because they're separated in the corpus of Scripture. But now getting back to the heart of the story here in Daniel as we move on. So in verses 3 through 4, the, the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the Israelites from the royal family, from the nobility. So it's possible that Daniel has a very close connection to David um, or something of a distant one because we don't know exactly what house he came from. From scripture, but nonetheless, these men are supposed to be young men without physical defect, good looking, suitable for instruction. In other words, to be taught in all, let's put this in quotes, wisdom. They have to be knowledgeable, perceptive, and capable of serving in the king's palace. Now, I circle this because there is some speculation that it might not necessarily be only in the king's palace. Some other open options are temple service, and it is widely known from the extant texts that we have from this time in Babylon, that temple servants were not necessarily slaves. There were slaves that did work on temple grounds, but these temple servants were not slaves. They were part of the Freedmen's Guild or association or whatnot. And so with that, uh, because they're not slaves, uh, people like Daniel could certainly wind up working in a class like this. And a big part of what they're responsible for is the liturgical observances in this place, uh, also for rituals with respect to not sacrifices necessarily because you have an operative priesthood for that sort of thing, but making sure that all the resources necessary were available, moving around the statues for 
proper ceremonial moments of, of observance and whatnot, because they wouldn't always stay stationary in those places. And then, of course, preparing the meals, because large, festive meals were prepared multiple times a day with a smorgasbord of food brought out before these gods on tables and whatnot. We'll get into that just in a little bit. So temple servants would be re responsible for all these things. And a known thing uh, that was required of these is that they had to be fit. So with that in mind, it's possible that there could be an illusion here to the idea that Daniel and these others, if they were not necessarily picked for service in the king's palace, they could also be suitable for uh, service in these other areas. In other words, what Daniel's going through here, along with uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and uh, Azariah, is they are going through something of a selection process because they have to be trained up. And then after this, they have to be, as we already read, interviewed by the king. And if they were found acceptable, but not quite on the standard the king wanted for those within the palace, then other duties would be found for them. So at this point in the story, we do not yet know what they're destined for. But with what's being described here in verses three through four, that's what we're being made aware of, is that this is could, could be what they're going to be uh, pushed forward or into. But of course, people who are living much closer to this time would have readily understood that versus us. We have to look to extra biblical material to help us recognize that's what's going on. And of course, it's so easy for us to let our eyes glaze over and not really dig into those details. If we are, we've read the book of Daniel many times over, we already know what's going to happen with Daniel. So we don't bother digging into this stuff. But when we do, it uh, broadens our sense of understanding with respect to what could have been the fate of Daniel um, had he not been selected for service within the king's palace and what that would have meant. And of course, the reason why this is important is because if Daniel was being made aware of that, what all the options were for service and where he was going to be positioned when this whole ordeal was over and done with, and he doesn't know that the, the palace itself is where he will land, what's going through his mind? What's the the thing that's stirring up in his heart and in his mind that we'll read here in just a minute with respect to why he chooses to not take from the king's provisions, eat the food, drink the wine, and instead wants this opportunity to be tested as goes, we'll take this select diet and whatnot and what, what all that means and why he chooses to have this rather silent rebellion on, on his part and honoring God and eschewing what the king wants for him, but in some paradoxical way also being complicit. Anyway, as we isolate some of the more weightier matters, as goes wisdom here, we understand this is not godly wisdom, of course. This is not something that is derived from what God offers, which, of course, has its foundation in the opening story of Scripture itself. The choice between the two sources of wisdom, God's wisdom and the tree of life, wisdom that God will open their minds to in time as he defines it for them in the tree of Tobin Ra, or good and evil or bad. But, of course, that takes on its own uh, distinct form of wisdom if the image bearers take from that tree, and that represents them wanting to define for themselves what is right and wrong without God doing it, hence the reason why it becomes sinful. But the woman looked upon it, and she re recognized or realized that what was on that tree was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So wisdom would come, but it's just a different type of wisdom, and that in and of itself is really as we continue on through the progression of the biblical narrative, the kind of wisdom that we find operative here in the story of Daniel. This has become the crux of what worldly wisdom is, the idea of trying to discern what the will of the gods is, false spiritual entities who, of course, do not exist. And uh, or if they do, they are they are representative of spiritual entities and in high places that actually uh, the scroll of Daniel doesn't wind up getting into much later on. And I've alluded to several times in previous lessons, but the point being that this is wisdom that is not what God brings. It's wisdom that is part of this occultic practice of attempting to try to div divine what these gods have in store for humanity and how to either use that to the advantage of humanity or perhaps in some way avoid the catastrophe through posturing and various other things or appeasement to the gods. And of course, this is something that Daniel is going to wind up becoming a subject matter expert on if he continues down this path. And of course, in order to do that, he's going to have to understand what's been written 
through all the many centuries of the Babylonian kingdom and the collection of the Chaldean uh, language and literature, right? So let's take a moment, a pause, and go back to what has at least been said by Moses in the Torah with respect to occultic practices. He says in Deuteronomy 18, the address he gives to this generation who will actually go into the promised land, and of course, what was already reiterated to the previous generation, or I should say, what was iterated to the previous generation, now reiterated to this one. But of course, they died in the wilderness. He says, when you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not imitate the detestable customs of those nations. No one is to sacrifice his son or daughter in the fire, practice divination, tell fortunes, interpret omens, practice sorcery, cast spells, consult a medium or a spiritist, or inquire of the dead. These are detestable to the Lord. This is the reason why God is driving them out. And you must be blameless before the Lord your God. There's no question that some of these things, not all of them, but some of these things are certainly the kind of things that Daniel and this entire guild of people would be required to do, depending upon where Daniel would be stationed at. So because he doesn't rebel against this practice, and because we do not have any sense of a suggestion that there's an abortion on the part of the king, Nebuchadnezzar, that he, after hearing Daniel speak, says, okay, I don't want them doing this anymore. I'm taking them out of this school, and I have other plans for Daniel. For all intent and purpose, what we gather from this is that Daniel and his three companions all completed this course of training that they were supposed to do. doesn't mean that they employed all of this, because it's just basically kind of like the first two years of college for us, right? A lot of prereq courses that are generic and could go toward almost any major. It's not going to be after you finish all that. You really start getting into your specific course of study. So it sets them up for a broad range of possibilities, as goes their future employment. But it may not require that they actually use any of that stuff, depending upon where Nebuchadnezzar actually sees need for them and a stat or a positions them. Continuing on with the text in Daniel, as we see that this occultic stuff is wrong and why this is going to become a problem for these men if they continue forward with this. The king then assigned them daily provisions from the royal food and from the wine that he drank. <clears throat> now we go back to Leviticus chapter 11. So this is a very common opinion and a position that's taken by scholars but it is not unanimously agreed on by no means. Few things are in scripture. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, I, it's a, an opinion that's definitely worth exploring because we don't really have anything in the text of Daniel that immediately shuts this down as not being a possible option. So we go to Leviticus 11 and the Lord speaks to Moses and he tells them, you may eat of all these kinds of land animals. And of course, these words in some measure are reiterated in Deuteronomy. You may eat any animal with divided hooves that chews the cud, but among the ones that chew the cud or have divided hooves, uh, you are not to eat. And of course, we have a laundry list of animals. And it's, I think, also important to recognize that if you're reading that list of animals from a study Bible, you're going to have a plethora of superscripts, subscripts, whatever, that's going to reference you to the bottom of your page or somewhere on that page that will tell you you know, we really don't know what exactly every one of these words mean, because in Hebrew, because these are very ancient words, some of the original meanings may be lost. And so different translations will have different words substituted in there for these types of animals. But we have them in groupings that are mostly agreed upon with respect to scavenger types of animals and birds and whatever the case might be. The point is, is we draw this back to the Daniel text, is that one of the common ways of looking at the reason why Daniel defies the king and doesn't want the food from his table is that it's very possible some of those animals may have been unclean animals. But here's the thing. We would have to rely solely on biblical in, uh, extra biblical information to know for sure whether or not that's the case, because we do not have any hint in the, the text of Daniel to know whether or not the food offered Daniel was unclean. In fact, a deep dive into understanding what types of foods were offered as sacrifices to Mesopotamian gods, of which obviously Babylon and their pantheon fit right into that, is that many of the, the animals that were offered to those gods were animals that were offered up in cultic sacrifices to Yahweh. And so we're talking rams, we're talking lambs, we're talking oxen. And so with that, any of those will be acceptable. <clears throat> 
So then the next thing that perhaps we might throw onto that is the idea that maybe the, the fact that they are offered to idols and with that, that would bring in um, into it maybe this text from Ezekiel, as goes the idea that maybe the way that it's prepared is what the problem is. Because in Ezekiel, again, contemporary to Daniel, he says to them, therefore say to them, this is what the Lord says, you eat meat with blood in it, which of course goes all the way back to the time of Noah and the part of the covenant that God made with him as he comes off the ark that they are not to eat meat with blood in it. That it has its basis there, but of course gets much more uh, specifically defined inside the, the covenant terms that God gives with Moses to the people. This is considered detestable because it's the thing that other cultures do. And of course, it's the fact that there's life in the blood. It's the essence of life. And it's supposed to be completely drained out of the animal before the animal itself is consumed. And then it has to be treated in a ritualistic, ceremonially acceptable way as goes disposing of it so that it is not treated as a common thing. It's always meant to be treated as a holy thing. But other cultures did the same thing with respect to treating blood in various different ways or manipulating it. It's possible that some of the food may have still had blood in it or maybe just was not prepared in a way that was acceptable. Or it may be the fact that it was prepared by Gentile hands in a Gentile kitchen, in a Gentile setting. Just running down the gamut here of all the different diverse opinions that scholars have as to why Daniel was so averse to eating this type of food. Um, but what we do realize from the text in Hosea, who is a contemporary to Isaiah, so over a century before Daniel, is that this is a mark in and of itself of being in exile. When he says, they will not stay in the land of the Lord. Instead, Ephraim, northern kingdom, will return to Egypt and they will eat unf unclean food in Assyria. So I bring this up because Daniel, I'm sure, would have been very much familiar with the words of Hosea, again, having been solidified over a century before his time. And with that, if he understood, look, this was the fate of the northern kingdom when they were taken off into exile. Now, here I am. I am in exile in a foreign land. But God said this of them, and I do not want to partake of that because it's a measure of their decimation, being off in exile like this and completely separate from the land and no longer a distinctive people, as goes the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and God's covenant people, they will have to eat unclean food if they want to survive. And if that's the case, I would much rather just eat what I can uh, and survive on that without having to be completely defiled by ingesting these things into my body. And that could be part of it, too, that's weighing on his mind. But what we must take special precaution to do is only pay attention to what the actual biblical text says and let it speak first before we bring in the conjecture, conjecture from outside sources of the Bible as to what um, exactly would have been the reason for Daniel's uh, hesitancy here. So let's actually go back to the text in Daniel and read further and see what is said here. <clears throat> that after this is made known that um, they're going to be receiving provisions from the king's table, and we haven't gotten to the point where he actually rebels. Further information is given. They, meaning these four men, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, were to be trained for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to attend the king. Among them from the Judites were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. The chief unit gave them new names. He gave them the name Bel Belteshazzar to Daniel, Shadrach, to Hananiah, Meshach to Mishael, and Ab Abednego to Azariah. Now, what we need to understand here, excuse me, is that every one of these Hebrew names has some reflection on God and some measure of his character. Daniel, God is my judge. Hananiah, Yah, a shortened form of Tetragrammaton, W-H-Y-H, or Yahweh. Yahweh has been gracious. Mishael, who is what God is, and Azariah, Yah, has helped. But notice with the changing of these names, every single one of their names reflects a different deity of <clears throat> the Babylonian panthe pantheon. Daniel's new name, Belteshazzar, Baal will protect, Shadrach, command of Aku, Meshach, who is what Aku is. So it's almost a parody of Mishael's name as it's changed to Meshach. And Eben uh, Abendigo, he is the servant of Nabu. So part of this program here is to strip these Judite 
exiles who have now been assimilated into Babylonian territory, culture, custom, and now indoctrinated with respect to language and customs uh, and the liturgy of their worship calendar and all these various things to potentially become temple servants or, of course, to know how to advise the king if they are chosen to serve the king in some capacity. And then there are a wide range of possibilities for service in the palace. One of those could be an advisatorial role to the king if he so selects them for that very thing. And of course, we know as the story plays out, he will. But before they ever get to that point, every one of these exiles from different lands are going to be given names from the chief eunuch, who is the person responsible for this niche of people, men and servants pulled into the king's palace for the purpose of training them for this very reason, right? So the idea is to completely strip them of any and all identity and connection to their land, their people, their God, and now rebrand them. And of course, the understanding would be that some of them may get the chance to have children if they're not forced to become eunuchs. And with that, their children will also embrace these practices, customs, and way of life. And eventually, within a generation or two, none of them will really have any memory or connection back to their ancestral land. They will just simply be Babylonian as far as anybody else is concerned, because even their very names would bear that out. So if their names and now their language and everything else is going to bear out the fact they no longer have loyalty, allegiance to their God, their ancestral land, or even their people as their own countrymen, but only to the will and might of Babylon, its emperor, its people, its agenda, and whatnot, then certainly the, the diet itself would seem to reflect the same thing. Now we get to the heart of the matter in verses 11 through 13. Daniel said to the guard whom the chief eunuch had assigned to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test. I'm going to point this out here in just a second. Your servants for 10 days, let us be given vegetables and, and uh, to eat and water to drink. Then examine our appearance and the appearance of our young men who are eating the king and the appearance of the young men who are eating the king's food and deal with your servants based on what you see. Now it's important, very important. First and foremost, we understand when it comes to this word vegetables here in Hebrew, it means a couple of different things. It's possible it could mean seed, as goes seed that is sown in the ground that will produce crops, but seed in itself that is edible, right? Fit for ingestion and human consumption. It's also possible it could mean pulse or pulses, so another edible type of food that's a vegetative kind of thing. But what we should not think necessarily is a cornucopia of vegetables, you know, just spilling out on the table from tomatoes to ears of corn and zucchini and various other things. It's far too restrictive to think about it from that perspective. Problem is, with our way of reading this in English, without any desire to go back to research this out in Hebrew, we are going to think with that kind of imagery and that Daniel is basically choosing to become a vegan in this point and abstaining from meat for whatever reasons he might have and that the, the vegetable diet itself is what is sustaining him. And I'm not saying the vegetable diet is not, but I, we should not be thinking about it from all of the wide range of different types of vegetables that could be available to him that we associate with the term vegetables. And that's how he is being sustained here. For this period of time. Not to say it doesn't grow into that later on. We really don't know how long Daniel continued to sustain this diet in practice of his beyond this 10-day period. We know it does go on for some time, but for how long? The text is silent on it, presumably for his entirety of, of his days in service to the kings of Babylon and Persia. But all that to simply say, this is important for us to recognize what the word itself means because it has some connection with other parts of scripture before this. Let's continue to embellish upon this. Part of the reason, too, perhaps why he's refusing to take food from the king's table may have little to nothing to do with the fact that it's prepared by Gentile hands because that doesn't really seem to pass the common sense test when we think about the fact that he doesn't want meat prepared by Gentiles, but he's willing to take seed and vegetables or pulses prepared by Gentiles, touched by Gentile hands, in association with other foods in Gentile food preparation areas or kitchens. So that would seem to really go against what his operative reason would be if it's the fact it's prepared by Gentiles. Granted, you know, not taking away 
food or taking food that's been offered to idols. But meat would not be the only thing offered on tables to idols. It, of course, would be sacrificed in a ritualistic way, but on the tables where that meat was per, uh, presented to the idol and uh, uh, perhaps a feast uh, of temple servants and various other people getting the chance to partake of, many different vegetables were as well, from sesame seeds to all, all kinds of different other things, too, of vegetative and fruit-like qualities. So uh, if that's the case, it, would that be another re, uh, detractor then from wanting to eat any food on that table? And if so, then it, it creates a very small range of things that Daniel perhaps would want to consume. And maybe that's not really the reason in and of itself. And then, of course, you know, it does take the concept out of it, you know, if there's blood still in it uh, or whatnot. But again, if we're starting to pick apart some of these reasons and think upon the idea of, well, maybe there's something a little deeper here. What's going on? What we should also recognize, too, is that in the ancient Near East, sitting down at a king's table and partaking on a regular and consistent basis of the king's provision signified one very clear thing above many other things, and that was there is an expectation of loyalty and allegiance to the king because you take of the king's provisions, right? An analogous thing would be, you know, in our states, let's just say here for the state of Louisiana, but we're no different than the other 49 states. We take money from the federal government for various different things to subsidize various things. You know, I don't really want to get into all the details. And of course, I'm vastly ignorant of what most of those things are. But nonetheless, school systems are a great example of that. Uh, municipal police and law enforcement forces and whatnot. Again, I'll, I'll take federal monies and, and whatnot. And with that, that gives uh, an, a clear and understanding. And especially we've seen this kind of thing happen in the last two or three years with respect to the rise of cancel culture. I'm not trying to trigger anybody with this, but it is what it is. And part of that is the understanding there's been a threat by both Democrat and Republican presidents alike that if certain peoples or organizations don't get in or even states don't get in line with certain agendas, then federal funding would be withheld because the expectation is you're loyal and allegiance to us. And if so, then we'll give you money. But the moment you stop doing that, we're not going to give you that anymore. Well, in the ancient Near East, it would perhaps come with much more dire consequences um, if the agenda was not honored, as goes what this means with the servant sitting at the king's table. In this case, the servant could be another king that is ruled over by the greater th king with more authority and whatnot. Or, uh, you know, a nobleman sitting at the king's table, whatever the case might be. But we find this even in the early portion of, uh, portions of Scripture, in the Joseph story, right? When he <clears throat> arrays the table in his home, his palace, uh, for all of his brothers to sit down and eat, and they partake of a portion from his table. The idea is that when they sit down to eat peaceably with him, they recognize, hey, and, and we are subservient to him. And they even call themselves servants to Joseph more than once. And so for Daniel to be partaking of Nebuchadnezzar's table, the one thing that becomes very clear is that he is dependent upon Nebuchadnezzar's provisions. Notice what I said. He is dependent upon the king. But who is Daniel's real king? It's not necessarily the son of David. It is the one that the son of David derives his earthly authority to rule over his people from, and that is the king of kings, who rules over the cosmos, who is still Daniel's king, even in exile. Another place to see this perhaps a little bit more clearly is the story uh, of Saul. And of course, when he is in the heights of the throes of his paranoia, um, it's a bit of a lengthy passage, but I think it paints the picture well. In chapter 20 of 1 Samuel, the, the day came after the new moon, the second day, David's place was still empty. Man, get your right thing. David's place was still empty, and Saul asked his son Jonathan, why didn't Jesse's son come to the meal after yesterday or today? At all the new moons, it was expected that David, as a servant of Saul, would be there because it's his proper place. So Jonathan said, uh, well, David asked my permission to go to Bethlehem, and uh, he, he said to me, please let me go because our clan is holding a sacrifice in my town, and my brother has told me to be there. Of course, this is all a lie. So now if I have found favor with you, let me go so I can see my brother's. And that's why he didn't come to the king's table. Notice the use of the word favor here, because Jonathan being the crown prince and the representative of his father, 
that the idea would be that if Jonathan granted favor, it would be an extension of Saul granting favor and it would be honored, right? And so with that, it's the concept of favor being granted to the one who was dependent upon the king. And that too is operative here in the Daniel text. We'll get to that here in just a second. But nonetheless, he says uh, that's why he didn't come to the king's table. That's why he didn't come to the king's table. But of course, Saul's angry and he senses here a plot to overthrow him as king. And he goes on a tirade here and he dresses down his son and he even attempts to try to kill Jonathan. Uh, and he pronounces very clearly that David must die. But a part of this is an affront, an offensive affront to Saul because of the fact that David is not present at the table. And it means that in his mind, he is sensing a break of loyalty and allegiance to David, although Saul comes to this feast with the intent of killing David in the first place. It wasn't because the fact David was absent that Saul now becomes angry, enraged, and wants to kill him. That just adds fuel to the already simmering fire. But nonetheless, we can see how this would be an offensive measure on the part of David not showing up, and hence the reason why Jonathan knows he has to say something to Saul versus just saying, I don't know. I mean, David's a grown man. He can go do what he wants to do. Absolutely not. He is a servant of the king. It's understood that he is dependent upon the king because he's invited to come and partake of the king's table. All the reason why David, in his great show of mercy and grace to Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, offers him a place at his table and provisions to eat every day. It wasn't because Mephibosheth was a poor man and needed this stuff. He gives all of Saul's estate to Mephibosheth. He will have enough to feed him like he was a king. It's just to simply say that he wants Mephibosheth to know that he can be dependent upon David and David will be fully reliable to provide for him as he wants to provide for the remnants of Saul's house. Uh, another thing here, with respect to the idea of the seeds um, that we're talking about, as goes vegetables, Leviticus 11 might be a good place to look to for that. Uh, let me read the verse first, and then I'll explain why. He says, uh, Moses, to the people, if one of their carcasses, this is a dead animal, so it's speaking to the idea of a carcass falls on something, it makes it unclean and has to be either cleaned in a proper way or it has to be destroyed. But if a uh, carcass falls on any seed that is to be sown, which means it could be fit for human consumption then, then the seed itself is clean. So the seed does not need to be destroyed, and it does not need to be made clean. It's already clean. It is never defiled. Notice what I said. It's never defiled. It's undefilable unless water has come into contact with the seed because it could break open. And with that, its products be exposed to maybe a disease the animal was carrying, which caused its death, a disease that has crept in after the animal's dead, bacteria and various other things. But as long as the shell is intact, and presumably it would be so if uh, upon visual inspection, it is, and of course, it's known to have not come into contact with water. It's still fit for human consumption, uh, at least for basic human uh, health is concerned um, and all things associated with that. But more importantly, how this ties into vegetables and the fact that the Hebrew word seems to come a little bit more closely to the concept of seed is because maybe what Daniel is doing here in the of all the things that he is choosing to partake of rather than the king's portions, is because this in and of itself is something that's not defilable. And he does not want to be defiled. That's his statement. He, he's asking the eunuch, please do not lay, force us to eat this stuff so that we will not be defiled, right? So part of there, it's a multifaceted thing, as goes the reasons for why he doesn't want to eat this food and why he makes the choice of what he does. It's possible the Leviticus text may bear, bear or shed some light on that, but it's not definitive. I just throw that out there as a possibility because as Bible students, we should be asking ourselves these questions and scratching our heads and trying to derive an answer, but we might not get a completely clean one. But let's move forward with the Daniel text in verse 14. So the chief eunuch agreed with him about this and he tested them for 10 days. Now up here, I circle testing and water and I want you to see how the word is used here again, as goes testing. Let's think about this for a second. So as we started talking about last week with the Jeremiah text, what we're seeing here is the rise of a new period of exile, which we know eventually is going to be followed by Exodus. And we're going to talk about that theme as it develops in later stories. But what I do want you to see here very clearly, though, <clears throat> is that 
as this period of exile has begun and it comes in waves before it's finally um, the, or definitively in that period when the destruction of Jerusalem has occurred, it's already begun for any of these people who are now living in Babylon. So with this story of exile and exodus, of course, like I said last week, it parallels in many ways to the biggest example, the best example we have of this, that, of course, is part of the racial memory and the point of reference for so many writers in the prophets and the Psalms. And that is the story of Israel's exile in Egypt and her exodus out of Egypt, which requires a Moses-like figure to bring them out of exodus. I know you hear me talk about this a lot, but. I mean, man, the Bible is so replete with this stuff. But notice the connections here. Because when we go back to Exodus 15, verse 25, Israel is already in their wilderness trek and hasn't even gotten to Sinai yet. They're just on the western side of the Red Sea. So they cry out to the Lord. Uh, well, Moses does because they have arrived there at Marah. The water is undrinkable. God shows them a tree, throws it into the water, becomes drinkable. But we notice here, the Lord made a statute and an ordinance for them at Marah. He tested them there. Tested them in what way? To see what they would do in this situation when they need water because they ran out. And God is going to be the one that wants to provide provisions, but he doesn't just simply throw it out there for them to start picking up or getting after. Instead, he waits to see what will their response be. When they realize that they are in dire straits and they can't provide for themselves, Will they choose to call on God or will they act based off their own fleshly inclination, which, of course, they do so many times, which is to gripe, grumble, complain. And then, of course, God in this first test wants to be benevolent to them, but then he starts to get frustrated himself with future tests because of the fact that they seem to not learn anything from the previous ones. But I digress. Another instance here is in the very next chapter in Exodus 16. The Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you. People are going to go out each day and gather enough. But then in this way, I will test them to see whether or not they will follow my instructions. What do we have here? But the simple concept of water and bread from heaven being the subject of the testing. Now, you may say, OK, well, that kind of parallels because we've got Daniel and his compatriots eating vegetables and drinking water. So there's the water thing. The vegetables, mm, I don't know. Well, remember, the Hebrew word seems to come a lot more closely to the concept of seed for human consumption than it actually does, again, a cornucopia of vegetables <clears throat> that we might think or associate with this. And remember the descriptions given in the Torah of what the, the manna itself actually looked like, that it resembled coriander seed that was covered with honey, right? So... <laughs> There's a much stronger parallel than what we might think at face or, or surface level. And again, both of these were orchestrated as tests before they even get to Sinai to determine how the people would react. And so to show them, look, this is how you responded when you were destitute and in need. But I was benevolent. Trust me, I will continue to be benevolent. You don't need to react that way again. You will know that I will give you these things and do it in supernatural ways, as he did in both of those instances and goes beyond that as goes the breaking open of rocks to give them water. So where is Daniel and his friends? They're off in a new Egypt of sorts, that being Babylon. It's a reverse picture of the Exodus in a sense, because in Moses' story, they are coming out of exile, going through Exodus to come into the promised inheritance and the promised land where God will dwell with them, right? The new Eden space. But here they've been taken out of the Eden space in Daniel's story, and they're carted off to a new Egypt. But nonetheless, Egypt is as much wilderness as the wilderness itself is because the terminal end of the exile is, or the exodus is supposed to be in the promised land. So they're having to repeat the whole exile in, quote, Egypt, end quote, to come back into the promised land story arc, right? So with that, they're going back into the wilderness, and if they're beginning their phase in the wilderness again, what should we expect to see? But testing, testing here. And of course, who is the one orchestrating the test? God. Who's the one who's supposed to lead the people in understanding what this means? Moses. Daniel already seems to have a very firm grasp here of what the significance of this is when he's starting this process of going through these cultic indoctrination that Nebuchadnezzar has orchestrated for them. But he knows, and this is the thing, 
that if he partakes of the provisions the king will give from his table, it's to show very clearly where his allegiance and loyalty lies. And he could be one of those people who's like, are you kidding me? We've got one of the best possible places, unlike our poor and unfortunate countrymen who are living out in uh, these ramshackle buildings or whatever called houses and scratching a living off of rocks as indentured servants or whatever else to other people just trying to survive while we get to live here in the palace and wear all these nice clothes and eat this wonderful food from the king's table. I would not do anything to jeopardize this. Whereas Daniel and his friends want to do that right up front, not by just re ignore or uh, refusing to partake in any of this, but to say, we're willing to go along, not to just simply get along. We're willing to go along with this to see how this plays out. But we do not want the king to, uh, to or we do, we want it widely known throughout the palace that our allegiance is not simply to the king. We are willing to work with the king and work for the king. But our allegiance is not to the king in the way that you as citizens of this kingdom would be. Our allegiance, which is borne out in the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel 3, <clears throat> reverberates along these lines as well. And that is our allegiance is to the king of the cosmos, the god of Israel, the god of all humanity, the god of the earth, right? So it's a new exile phase, and it's a new wilderness phase, and it's beginning to show as there are many points of parallel between Daniel and Moses, how Daniel is something of a Moses figure guiding the people through this, even though he's not firmly embedded amongst them like Ezekiel is. And Ezekiel was a new Moses figure as well in, in uh, his own right in many different ways. But all that to say, there are some intertwining of those storylines for good reason. And that is to show that at the beginning of this new exile phase, God is with his people in exile. God is testing them. And of course, God is granting reward because unlike the people of Israel who fail miserably at these tests time and again, Daniel starts off on the right foot. And what happens? Notice in the first test in Exodus chapter 15, where God tells them as he st sets that up as a statute, an ordinance to look back on. If you trust me, if you heed my word, then I will not bring on you the plagues of Egypt. Instead, I will give you this as he brings them to Elim, where there are 12 springs of water to drink from and 70 date palm trees, the blessings of Eden. You will reap this over and over uh, without fail. So go back to Daniel 1 verse 9 and notice that God has already granted Daniel kindness and compassion. This word here has said in Hebrew, favor would be another way of looking at it. And we've already seen how this has played out to some extent in the storyline here of Saul, David, Jonathan, or whatnot. But let's see it play out in the storyline of Daniel. It's going on here. Notice this in Ezekiel, uh, Exodus chapter 15. As Moses is bringing uh, this song of uh, song by the sea to a climactic point, he says, with your faithful love, this word here is the same, has said, faithful love, you will lead the people you ever deem, you will guide them to your holy dwelling and with your strength. So what am I saying here? This is another thing beginning right after exile is coming to its end and exodus and redemption is beginning as he has drawn them through the Red Sea and severed their connection and dependency upon Egypt in every way. God is doing the same thing here. Before Daniel's trek with the king ever begins, he's already showing him, has said, favor. And he's going to continue to do that after Daniel begins the process of showing who, who to whom and where his true loyalty and allegiance lies and rests with, and that is Yahweh. And God is then going to give them this is the same uh, word here or verb um, that is used up here with respect to King Nebuchadnezzar giving them from his table. God is the one now who is granting, and he is the uh, one who is granting these men knowledge, understanding, and every kind of literature and wisdom. And he makes them stand out tenfold better than any of the rest of those who serve in Nebuchadnezzar's court, right? And such that Daniel even can interpret visions and dreams of every kind. And who knows how many he did this of beyond just that of Nebuchadnezzar's. And we understand that part of the testing, as Moses reminds them 40 years later in Deuteronomy, the reason why God orchestrated the tests as he did with manna and water was he said, he humbled you by letting you go hungry. Then he gave you the manna to eat, but he humbled you by first letting you go hungry so that your ancestors would know that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And I've 
obviously this is the very thing that Jesus recites to Satan, who is tempting him to try to turn bread in or uh, stones into bread to sate his hunger, or satiate his hunger after 40 days of fasting in the wilderness, right? Yet again, another layer of meaning and parallelism brought into that story because Part of what Jesus is broadcasting in that is that while Satan is something of the prince of this world and orchestrates a fair measure or did at one point of authority over human kingdoms and whatnot before Jesus's exaltation to the right hand of the father and the inauguration of the kingdom of God. Right. All that to simply say that Jesus is working here to subvert Satan's agenda. Satan wants Jesus to simply avoid the cross, worship him, sin, and then, of course, um, in every way, shape, and form, fail to uphold this plan and agenda God has for him, but Jesus will not. <clears throat> and he subverts Satan's agenda here by citing this wisdom from the Torah that Moses gives to the people of Israel and recognizing that God sustains his people, and especially in the wilderness. And if they learn to trust him, then Eden blessing is what comes on the other end of that, and that's what Jesus had come to release to the world. Eden blessing. And so to sum this up with respect to this story of, da of Daniel here, what we are clearly seeing is that Daniel is going to go along with the agenda of the king, and he is going to become an, an, an enrollee in the school of Babylonian Chaldean wisdom and knowledge and whatnot. But he is making it known very clearly by staking his claim up front to, to whom and where his allegiance, allegiances and loyalties lie, and that is with Yahweh his patron god, the god of the cosmos, who rules over Nebuchadnezzar as well. And God is showing his reward to Daniel and his compatriots by giving them, as he shows his favor to them, everything they need to be successful as they continue to work within the Babylonian kingdom to bring about God's agenda. And that, of course, it creates something of a indirect well it's direct in the sense that it happens but an indirect byproduct of blessing the kingdom of babylon which is what jeremiah told the exiles in babylon to pray for anyway was the prosperity of the city and the kingdom so that they prosper along with it right and that they experience peace and protection so what does this have for us i would just sum it up in a few seconds by simply saying wow the new testament is really replete with a lot of this theme of subversion of the agenda of the powers that we wrestle against that Paul speaks of in Ephesians principates that rule in dark places and whatnot the things that we do not wrestle against as goes flesh, flesh and blood but nonetheless the agents of the enemy oftentimes are flesh and blood but with that the understanding is is that we have to live in this exilic pattern Peter reminds us of that in his letters we are pilgrims, strangers, wandering through this land, waiting to find our home someday, which is going to be on this earth. But after God renews all things, he comes to dwell with us here permanently, uniting heaven and earth together once again. Having said that, as we do live as exiles, pilgrims, strangers, foreigners, aliens wandering through this, we cannot allow ourselves to be conformed to this world. Paul, Romans 12, a renewed by the transformation of our minds, right? As we submit ourselves humbly to the Lord, trust in him for his provisions of all things. And as we see the association here of water and food, a, a paradigm that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden in itself and the way that wisdom is associated with food. We don't have wisdom associated with God showing up and sitting Adam and Eve down, crossing their legs Indian style before him as he sits on a rock and he's expelling or expounding to them his words. It's not to say God didn't walk amongst them and share his words. He certainly did. That was a pattern that was already established for Adam and Eve. But the fact that wisdom was associated with the food that they ate and what it represented as goes who they were trusting versus what they were trusting and uh, the decisions they made there versus what Daniel is doing here and the complete reversal of that and the blessing that God continuously shows Daniel throughout his time here as a magistrate and um, a princely authority almost, like a new Joseph figure in the kingdom of Babylon, Israel's new Egypt that they're exiled into. Man, the, these parallels are just so rich. But the idea is that what we are understanding is that we subvert the wisdom of this world by not conforming to it. 
but instead remaining faithful to God and trusting the outcome for whatever it will be, whether like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, giving ourselves up to death if that's what's necessary because we will not bow the knee to anyone other than Yahweh. Or if he chooses to deliver us, then we'll thank him all the more. But nonetheless, we are agents of the king, enemies of the world, recognizing the words of the uh, apostle in the New Testament that friendship with, uh, with this world is in every way enmity with God, and we will not let ourselves fall prey to such a thing. So friends, strengthen, guard, gird your minds up every single day with this kind of understanding that we live as pilgrims and strangers, faithfully loyal to our God who loves and provides for us and will see us through to the end. And by virtue of that, standing as shining examples to others along the way. Jesus, our King, we ask that you give us this sense of understanding every single day as we begin a new day that you bless us with, because without you reminding us, Lord, there is all the more greater chance that we are going to do what we want to do that day. And we don't want to do that. We want to be obedient to you in all things, to honor you in all things. Thank you for these words. Help us to understand this message more and may it impact us in every way you intend for it to. In your holy name I pray. Amen. Thanks for listening.